we are in a series, kind of right in the middle of it, a series called Heaven and Hell. And we have been kind of looking at what the Bible has to say about uh, what life looks like after we pass from this earth. Uh, we've been focusing on kind of two weeks of hell and uh, looking at is hell a real place. Last Sunday, we talked about why would a loving God send people to hell. And uh, hopefully we've been kind of answering some questions. I know I've heard a lot of great things coming up in life groups and conversations and questions. And what I love about it is, is it gets us thinking about it. Now, we've talked about this over the weeks that not every question we have can be answered. Not everything that we want to know is knowable today. And the scripture tells us just enough to know what we need to know, but doesn't always answer everything we want to know. And so we have to trust God and believe that God is, is all-knowing, that he's faithful, that he's loving, that he's sovereign, that, that he has things covered. Even when we have question marks, even when we're not sure what it looks like, we know that God is in control. And we're looking at these difficult topics, and we've kind of thrown this verse up there each week, and I just want to remind us kind of a disclaimer every Sunday for us to understand, but it comes to us in Isaiah chapter 55, and I love this because it kind of frames the whole picture of these questions we have. I, even in our life group this week, there are so many things we're like, well, what about this? And what does God do about this? And what will happen when we such and such? And like I said, not everything we know about these difficult topics are uh, for us to know today. But God says this in Isaiah for us, as he spoke to us, he said, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. And so as we discover and as we dis look into scriptures and we have these questions that come up, not everything we want to know will know. And we have to just be faithful and trust that God knows that God is good and he's loving and he has these things under control. Well, today we're going to kind of turn the corner and talk about something a little bit more fun. And uh, not that hell isn't fun to talk about. It's, it's a difficult subject. But heaven is probably one of the most popular topics within the church, religion, world. Uh, books have been written. Uh, stories have been told. All these things that kind of help us understand what heaven is about. And we're going to look at this idea for the next two Sundays what is heaven? And then on February 3rd, uh, just three weeks from today, we are going to have a Sunday dedicated to answering all of your questions. Now, we have about a dozen questions that have come in so far, and many of those, unfortunately, are not clear for us to answer, but we're going to hopefully give you some ideas, uh, some direction of what God would say. But we want to encourage you, if you have any questions that come up, maybe there are things that you're like, well, what about this? Uh, you can go to our Facebook page, and we have a link in there that you can click, and you can submit a question completely anonymous, so you don't have to feel ashamed, like, oh, I don't want to ask this question, because then Zach will know I asked. No, I won't know. I, I won't follow any IP addresses. I'm not going to track you down. You can ask any question. No question is dumb. No question is off limits. And so we're going to hopefully collect those over the next week or two, and then on February 3rd, we're going to hopefully answer as many as possible that week. But today, we're going to look at heaven. And again, it's very popular. It's something that most people uh, enjoy talking about. They're interested in talking about. We did a survey in our church uh, weeks ago, uh, and we asked the question, does heaven exist? And again, like most people, 90% uh, of you said yes, 3% said no, and then 7% were not sure. And we're a little bit better than a national survey, but national survey across America, they came back and said that 79% of Americans believe in a heaven. And so it's a very popular idea of understanding what heaven is. And I want to kind of open up with a story, help capture this idea of our interest in heaven. There's a couple, an elderly couple that had passed away, and they found themselves in front of the pearly gates in heaven. And Peter was there and he welcomed them. And first he decided to show them their mansion. The elderly man, overwhelmed by the luxury of it all, he said, how much does this place cost Per night, Peter replied, sir, this is heaven. It doesn't cost anything. Then Peter uh, took them to the dining room and he showed them the tables upon tables piled high with the most delicious foods that you could imagine. Again, overwhelmed by the glory of, of it all, the man asked, how much for these meals? And Peter said, you forget, this is heaven. It's all free. Peter then took them out back and he saw this beautiful golf course, green, amazing. 
And the man stood there with an open mouth. And Peter said, now, before you ask, there are no green feeds. This is heaven. Everything is free. Then the man looked at his wife and said, you and your stinking brand muffins. I could have been here 10 years ago. Now, lots of funny jokes. Again, a church joke. It's just cheesy and dorky. But it captures this idea, this interest that all of us have. As a, as a kid, I was fascinated with what will heaven be like and what will it look like and what will we do and this comprehension even in our own houses we've talked about it with our kids about heaven my oldest can't quite comprehend the idea of infinity right they just they just can't capture the idea of like what will we do the whole time and the first time my daughter asked i said well we'll be worshiping jesus and she kind of looked at her face like really we're going to be singing all the time. That sounds so boring. I'm like, well, yeah, I mean, no, it won't completely be like that. And well, how long will it be? Well, it'll be forever. Well, how long is forever? And you just know this as a kid, you kind of wrestle, even as adults of us understanding time and, and know, and we're like, wow, I just can't quite comprehend this idea of eternal, infinity. Again, we, we've been kind of popularized by cartoons and pictures and movies and this idea that, that heaven is a place where we white, wear white robes and we're given wings and we float around on clouds, right, playing the harp all day. And it's, it's popular for us to think about, but not quite biblical. Other of us, we think of kind of this idea of just eternal sleep, that we just lay around and rest and just enjoy the sunshine and, and not having to do a single thing again is our idea of what picture, or our picture of heaven many times, what looks like for us. Whether we've seen it in cartoons, pictures, books, movies, what is this fascination that we have with heaven? There's something that every single one of us are just drawn to this imagery and this idea of what heaven will look like. What will it be? What will we do? And the Bible gives us a little bit of an understanding of it, but not quite a full picture of it. Just like as we talked about with hell, we, we get just enough to just kind of give us a glimpse of what heaven will be. But for that fascination, we're all stirred with this idea of what will heaven be like. What I want to challenge you this morning as we kind of look at what heaven will look like, what it will be like, what will we do, and hopefully give you some understanding biblically what this looks like. The question I want you to think, the statement I want you to, to, to wrestle with today, the thing that I want you to take away this morning as we talk about heaven is this, is heaven is not about where you'll be, but it's more about who you'll be with. It's easy for us to get captured in the idea of, of mansions and streets of gold and floating around on clouds, which is not in the Bible, but in that idea of like, oh, it'll be amazing and play golf all day and sleep in all day and all these things that we sometimes can kind of get caught up in the imagination. It's not so much where or what we'll do, but it's who we'll be with. That's the element that we have to understand. And that is the picture, the beauty, the, the, the best part about heaven is not what it will be like or where it'll be, but who we will be with. It's the one element that is hard for us to understand, hard for us to grasp, but it's the one thing that we will spend eternity exploring and enjoying is the company that we will be with in heaven. Again, we're going to be in the book of Revelations. If you have a Bible, turn with me to Revelations chapter 21. You can go to the very end of your Bible, even all the way to the index, and then go just a few pages over to the very last page of the Bible and kind of the book ends Genesis and Revelations Genesis or Revelations chapter 21 we'll kind of look at the first few verses here but as you're turning there I want to give you a little bit of a context here if you've ever read the book of Revelations you'll know it's very uh, out there very picturesque it's very imaginative and 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 as humans we've tried to grasp it we've tried to understand it we've tried to there's books written about you know well this is what he's actually talking about and this is what it's about and, and all these different ideas that we have to understand how do we read revelations how do we read this picture that is written by john as he talks about this we see in this scripture of the bible talks about or revelation talks about heaven being streets of gold and pearly gates and this incredible stones that will adorn heaven and we have to understand that John, who wrote the book, who spoke about heaven, he was speaking of it metaphorically, okay? And he describes heaven through this lens of metaphorical picture. It's, I don't believe that he's talking literal. 
again, kind of comes back to this idea that John has seen something so amazing that the only way he can kind of describe it is like this. And we could be wrong. We could get to heaven. It could be exactly as John's talking about. We don't know. But most scholars believe that the book of Revelations is not written as a literal picture by picture, exact description, but given us a metaphorical idea of the sense and the presence and the feel of what heaven will be like. Again, it doesn't change anything. But what I love about this is an author named Bob uh, Deffenbaugh said this, and I love this, this idea of how to read and understand what John was talking about in the book of Revelation. He said this. He said, giving a description of heaven, like John does, in human words, is more difficult than an Eskimo going to Hawaii and then on his return trying to describe a pineapple to his people. Okay? I love that picture. It's like an Eskimo going to Hawaii, coming back to his people, and explaining what a pineapple is. You can imagine just the picture and the idea of this, this fruit that has all these spines on it and, it, and it's bright yellow on the inside, and you bite into it, and the juice is so... And, and you can imagine that those us, other Eskimos would be like, I don't understand. What does this mean? What does this look like? It's very similar to how John speaks about heaven. And so when we read this, we have to understand it from a picture of an idea that John is trying to capture the beauty and the essence of heaven, not give us an actual detailed blueprint of how heaven will be exactly. And so book of Revelations chapter 21 says this in verse 1. He says, As then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth has passed away, and there was no longer any sea. Now, just to stop here, very already beginning very out there, a new heaven and a new earth. Does that mean another planet comes? We don't know. But the idea would be, most scholars believe, that heaven will come to us in a new creation, a new place for us, and we will exist there. And he says that there's no longer any sea. I don't, most scholars believe, he's not literally talking about that there would be no more water on earth. But in, on the context of this passage, the sea represents sin, that there'll be no longer sin on the earth. He's not literally talking about the water that we know of and the sea that we know of, but the idea that heaven will come and we will go there, the old earth, the old ways will pass away, and there'll be no longer any sea which represents sin. Then he says in verse 2, he says, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, okay, this is be the city of God. This is where God's people will dwell, not the literal geographical place of Jerusalem, but the new city, the new uh, dwelling place for God's people, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. Again, this comparison, this idea of a bride on her wedding day, and amazing, beautiful, stunning, will be what heaven will look like to us. And then I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them, and they will be with his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. And then he will wipe every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. And then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of water of life. And those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. We're going to look at it again just each week, trying to pull out some truths that we can understand, that we can read in the Scripture and understand and, 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 and give us some anchor points to understanding what heaven is. There's four truths that we're going to look at today. And we look at this passage and we see kind of what, what John is talking about and how God's revealing. Again, movies have played this up and books have written it. And, and it could be all that. We don't know, you know, for sure. But we can read these and understand a couple of these basic truths. And number one is this, is that we can read out of this passage for sure that heaven is a real place, okay? Now, it's a place that isn't yet finished. It's a place that we will inherit with God and uh, when he finally judges and everything comes to the end, then at that point, we will go to heaven. Most scholars believe it's not so much us going there, but heaven will come to us and new will be created. Uh, again, speculating, understanding this passage of a new heaven and new earth uh, will come and we will live and exist there. It says this in Revelations 21.1, we read this, it said a new heaven and a new earth uh, for the first heaven and the first earth has passed away and there is no longer any sea. 
saw the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. Again, speculation on who's going and where it's coming. We can only speculate, but we do know that heaven is a place. It's a created place by God. Uh, heaven is created by God for us to dwell with him for eternity. The Bible uses a few different names, kind of like hell, uh, different phrasing for heaven. A couple of the ones are the kingdom, kingdom of God, uh, the Father's house, paradise, and a new earth are kind of uh, all translated in different ways to communicate. Uh, you might remember the word paradise when Jesus is on the cross and the thieves are there and he begins to talk to the other thief and he kind of gives his life to Christ and he goes, with, you will be with me in paradise today. Another term of uh, heaven could be used there. Uh, most, most used is heaven. It, it we see today in our modern context kind of that word. Now, another element to this that we need to understand is that we see in this very, very, very first verse here in Revelation that he says that he's preparing a new heaven and a new earth. Jesus told his disciples in the book of John chapter 14, if you look at this verse, Jesus tells him as he's leaving that he's going away to there, which represents a place, heaven, to prepare a place for them. It says this, do not let your hearts be troubled. He said, you believe in God and believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. This is where Audio Adrenaline made the famous song, you know, of my father's house. Uh, a great song, not necessarily 100% accurate in, you know, play football. If you've heard the song, some of you are like, I don't know what you're talking about. So diehard old Christian music fans will know that song. Uh, again, he says many rooms. Uh, again, I don't, we don't believe that he's talking actually literal, but a place that will house lots of people. Uh, he said, if there were not so, what I have not told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me. And you may also be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. So he's talking about this to his disciples. Again, the disciples didn't quite understand the context of eternity and heaven. But Jesus is telling them, hey, I'm going to leave you for a while. And I'm going to go to my father's house. And I'm going to go prepare a place for you. And like we talked about last week, and there'll be a point in time where I will come back and I will gather you up and we will go be there together. I love this idea, this, this, this concept. This is probably one of the most asked questions throughout church life and church world is what will it look like? You know, what will heaven look like? And we don't have a full picture, but we do understand a few details here that we can read throughout Scripture and give us a little bit of a glimpse of what heaven could be, okay? Again, looking at the very nature of who God is, understanding this. And I believe this, in the same way that God paid attention to the details of the earth and the Garden of Eden in the very beginning of the Bible, we can assume that God is preparing a beautiful and unimaginable home for you and I. Now, we don't... We know for a fact it's going to be a good place. But we know by reading the book of Genesis chapter 1, if you have a Bible, you can turn there if you want. We're not going to read it. But bookmark it. Genesis chapter 1, go to the opposite end of the Bible. And we see this very detailed breakdown of God creating the earth. Okay? This very detailed and creative and beautiful garden that he created for Adam and Eve to live in. We can understand that in this very detailed, uh, intentional, loving process that God created, we can assume that God is going to put the same effort into heaven. Okay? Some scholars would say, well, he's been preparing this place since Jesus walked the earth. Yes, that is true, but the length of pre preparation is not the big deal, other than that he said he is going to prepare a place. We know, just by the very scriptures that we can read in Genesis chapter 1, that God was into the details of creating something so amazing. In fact, every time he created the sea and the land, he said it was good. It was good. He was so, he poured his love and his care and his creativity into us and his creation that we can believe that God is going to put the same effort and probably even more so into heaven, which he's creating for you and I. I believe this, that the Garden of Eden, if you've ever read it, you understand the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve walked in it. It was this beautiful, imaginable, just creation that God had made. 
I can believe this, as we read about that in Genesis chapter one, that the garden even gives you and I a glimpse into God's creativity and magnificence. That's the truth that we can understand. We can understand by reading the book of Genesis that, that God gives us just a glimpse of something that he was so proud of, something that he poured his love and his creative ability, he poured everything he had into creating the earth and the garden of Eden. That because he did that, we can imagine and know that that little bit of glimpse that we can understand by reading the scripture, we can see that God is creative and magnificent in what he's done. And here's the benefit of it. We know that heaven will far surpass the original Garden of Eden. Okay. The Garden of Eden was so wonderful, so amazing as far as what we can read. We know that heaven will far surpass that original. Now, there are some scholars and some belief that, that heaven will be a replica of the Garden of Eden. Could be. I think there are my own personal opinion is that they're probably very similar. They'll have some similarities, but we, I don't believe that we'll regress back into old technology and old life. Like we're going to keep progressing in what God has created us to be. It won't be like all of a sudden we're transported back to the original Eden and, you know, we're back to the old times. We'll progress forward. We'll be new bodies, new creation, but it ha could have a very similar uh, picture and could be very similar to the very earth that we live in today. We don't know that for a fact, but we can imagine if it was good in the beginning that I would imagine that God would create mountains and grass and seas and hills and atmosphere. All that stuff could be very similar to what heaven looks like. Again, that's my opinion. Uh, scripture does not give us a clear detail on what heaven will look like and, and the very specifics of the landscape and all that, but we can just assume that if it was good in the beginning, I would imagine that God believes it's good for us today and in heaven. Second thing we want to look at is that we have to understand that heaven will be perfect, okay? It'll be absolutely perfect. Uh, there'll be nothing in it that'll be flawed. There'll be nothing in it that won't be good. Everything in it will be perfect because God put his attention and focus in creating it. We, we live in a day, in a world today that sin has entered in, and because sin has entered in, death and decay and pain and evil and disasters and wars are around us all the time. And so it's hard for us to grasp a world where there is no pain, there is no evil, there is no sin, and there is no war. But heaven will be that place where they'll be absolutely perfect. No sin, no decay, no evil, no hate, no wars, nothing. That'll be what heaven is. Revelations 21, 27, if you read down, talks about this saying nothing evil will be allowed to enter, nor anyone who practices shameful idolatry or dishonesty, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Nothing evil will be allowed to enter. And the last thing on this, understanding kind of what heaven will look like, is that heaven will feel like home to us, okay? It won't be a place, um, I know every one of us, you know, the, the place that you call home, there's something about being away in a trip and you come back home and it's like, the familiarity, the smell, the, the sense of just like, oh, my own bed, my own home. There's that sense of security and, and, and rest and hope. Heaven will be like that for you and I. I know for many of us, we go, well, I, how will it be like that? What, how, how will that happen? I don't know how God will do it. But we will not feel like strangers there. We will feel like we are home in that place. I love Ecclesiastes 3 says this. He has also set eternity in the hearts of men. Okay, that we are destined to be with him. And when we get there, this will feel like we've been on a road trip, but that'll feel like home to us. Okay, so that's kind of the first big picture to kind of give us an understanding that heaven is a real place. It's perfect. Uh, it'll have a glimpse of, of creativity and love and, and everything that God has created will be in there and it'll feel like home for us. The second one is this, and I love this one because it gives us a great idea of what heaven will feel like. In heaven, you and I, we will be united with God and with people from every nation, tribe, and language, okay? Heaven is not just Americans, okay? I, I, know, I know Red Door knows that, but there are some churches that think oh, heaven will be just all Americans, you know? No, that's not true. That's not true at all. Actually, we'll probably be the least amount in there, heaven, on some levels, but... Uh, <laughs> We will be with every tribe, every nation, every language spoken. Now, what language will we speak in heaven? I don't know. I, I, 
you might, I don't know. I don't, it, it, could it be English? Maybe. It could be a different language. Who knows what it'll be. Uh, but we will be in heaven with every tribe, every nation, every language spoken, everyone across the world from past, present, and future will be together with God. Okay. I love this. In in verse three, it says this, and I heard a loud voice saying from the throne, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them and he will be with his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. What I love about this, this picture here is that heaven is a communal party. Okay. It'll be a, a gathering place for us to celebrate to enjoy the company of, of one another, but also with God. It'll be this, this constant celebration and party and enjoyment with God and with his people. I love this quote. He says this, the beauty and diversity of humanity will be displayed in all its brilliance as all types of people will worship the one true God. As we gather in our cities and our neighborhoods and our nation across the world, most churches and most people across the United States and, and even outside of the world is we gather with very similar types of people, okay? And there's beauty in that because we can connect and relate to certain people groups and demographics and, and, and economics and all that kind of stuff. But we have to understand when we pray on Sunday that we're praying for the big C church, that church is not just Red Door. It's not just us and Restoration Baptists and and Embrace and Ransom and Celebrate, all churches in Sioux Falls, but we're also the body of Christ one with the church in China and Africa and Europe and all across the globe, worshiping the one true God. We will be in the presence of every believer from every nation, people group, every language that's spoken will gather and worship together. If you've ever been part of a, maybe a multi-ethnic church, you can get a bit of a glimpse. We, honestly, we, I love our worship. I love our church and everything. But you get around an, another church from another country, especially maybe an African type of church, and their worship is totally different. They express totally different. And there's an element of there of just the celebration. Now, I'm not expecting everyone to dance on Sunday. You can if you want. But you go to an African church, and you're, you're, they're dancing around, and they, they're, they're joyful, they're celebrating, but there's just this diversity and love and excitement that happens. And you can just imagine getting into heaven and seeing all people worshiping. You can imagine how amazing that will be, how, how that will feel. I love in Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, he says this, After this, I saw a vast crowd too great to count, from every nation and tribe and people and language, standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes and held palm branches in their hands, and they were shouting with a great roar, salvation comes from our God who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. Just this picture of countless people worshiping one true God. I love this, and we miss it a little bit in America, this idea of community and fellowship, because we're so isolated, we're so independent, and We're so kind of just on our own that we kind of allow some people to kind of be a part of our life. But for the most part, Americans, especially Midwesterners, we we kind of create territory lines. And it's like, you can come as far as this. And and then eh, it gets a bit weird. But you just stay kind of on your boundary line and I'll stay on mine. And and once in a while, we'll cross over, enjoy some stuff. But I want to get right back to my own space, right? It's very true. Very, very, very true. But you go outside of the United States. And they have no boundary lines, okay? And for Americans, it's, it's uncomfortable. I mean, we've been over in other countries and been in villages, and it's like, for one thing, they, they hug all the time. And I'm, I'm not a, it's just surprising. <laughs> My wife is very touched. She loves hugging. And I'm like, oh, I've I hugged you once. Is that good enough? Do we have to hug every day? And, I, and then God convicts me and it's like, you're a husband, you know, lay down your wife, lay down your life for your wife. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that's for another time, another story. That's, that goes back to Genesis and being fruitful and multiply. Um, good thing she's not in the room because she'd be very embarrassed right now. Uh, you can tweet that. Um, 
but there's an idea of just community connecting with one another. Then you go outside the United States and, and people share vehicles and they share food and they share their life together. And, and they don't have these independent, like my house and your yard and, and you stay there and I stay there, but it's all together. And there's beauty in that because when you get into the idea of community, there's this idea of just lives are connected, that you love and care for each other, that you're there for each other. And that's the picture of heaven. You see, heaven was created to be enjoyed and shared with God and others, okay? I've always thought that, you know, I always thought as a kid, like, heaven would be the place when you go to your, your great-grandmother's house and they have all the china, and it's like, don't touch it, you stay there. It's like, is heaven going to feel like that? Is that baby-proofed, you know, human-proofed? Like, God's up there going, well, yeah, you guys can play outside, but don't come inside. And, you know, I've, I've spent centuries creating this. I don't need you making it all messy, Right? But heaven will be a place that we'll enjoy, that we'll share it and enjoy every moment of it with each other as well as with God. This idea that heaven will be a place of true community and, and complete fellowship. It's hard for us to imagine because we are so independent and, 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 and we kind of have these kind of my life and I kind of just keep things to myself. That in heaven will be shared experiences together. I can imagine the Bible talks about that we'll have opportunities to, to be with those who have gone before us. You know, you'll have opportunities to talk with Daniel about the lion's den and, you know, Noah and the ark and talk to the great stories and the scriptures of Paul who wrote, I mean, not to mention Jesus himself, as well as those who may be grandparents and relatives and maybe family ones that you've loved that, have gone to be with Jesus, that you'll have opportunities to spend eternity with them, sharing and talking and being with those who've gone before us. I can't imagine us having a hard time finding conversation with people in heaven, but we'll be together with one another. I love this picture. The Bible doesn't give us a complete understanding of this, but we can imply that even those that we have opportunity to share the gospel with, those that we witness to, that maybe you never saw come to Christ, at some point they did, and they come to heaven, and you have opportunity to meet those that you didn't even know gave their life. And you know, they could come to you and say, Man, I remember when you came and you shared with me and you prayed with me. You didn't know this, but I gave my life to Christ shortly after that. And it was because of you doing that. Can you imagine the, the impact, the people that you didn't even know that you directly had a hand in influencing that you'll get to be with, to celebrate? Again, we're just implying that it could happen. We, we do know that we'll have, be with others, but we will remember what our life was like. We'll remember people and know people. It's not like we get to heaven and we have a men in black, you know, wipe your memory out and we don't remember. That, that's not going to happen. We'll, we'll have the memories and the people we'll have interactions with. And the last thing about this, it's just hard for us to understand. We'll, we'll close with this in a few minutes here, but the element of being with God. Again, something that we can't grasp. In fact, no one in, in all of earth has, will have that experience other than us in heaven with God, to be with God in person, to be with him, to worship him, to experience him in his fullness will be something that we will, can't even grasp today, but we will be with him and get to experience and dwell with God himself, the one who created us, the one who spoke us into existence that made us, that destined us, that called us, we will be with in eternity. And so that's the second one. Third one is this. The last two will go quicker and we'll end on this last idea here. But number three is that heaven, there'll be no more sin, sorrow, pain, and death. Again, something that's hard for us to grasp completely here because we live in a broken, flawed world. But Revelation says that God will wipe away every tear from our eyes and there will be no more death, mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Now, we don't, is that instantaneous? Is there a moment that we experience mourning and those that we will miss, possibly? But we do know that heaven for eternity will be a place where there'll be no more tears, no more crying, no more pain, no more death, no more broken bodies and hurt feelings. When sin entered the world and brought death and pain and sadness and sorrow, uh, we've been on this separating point from that point forward. But when we come to Christ and we spend eternity with heaven, it's from that point on that we will experience a life 
in complete fullness of love, joy, kindness, will be secure in our identities, and the desire to sin will be gone. All of that. Again, hard for us to grasp. In fact, probably even for most of us, we can have moments of our life, maybe an hour or two, where we, we are kind and we are joyful and we have security in our, in our identity and we're, we're, we feel satisfied. In fact, I think there are moments when we gather as a church and we worship and God's presence is among us and there's something just tangible, like you don't even know how to experience it, but you just feel this sense of love and, and satisfaction and fulfillment and worship. That glimpse is just, just a tip of a little bit of what that will be like in heaven. I believe. I believe when God's church comes together and we're unified and we worship and God is speaking and he's, and he's with us because we know the scripture tells us that God is with us. The Holy Spirit is among us. And there's moments that we probably experience just a glimpse of what heaven could be like and then it fades away because sin enters and selfishness and pride and hurt and pain and death and all that stuff is here. Just imagine eternity in heaven where there is no sin and sorrow and pain and death, no wars, no hate. Everybody is, is fulfilled and satisfied and worshiped and encouraged. That is what heaven will be like. The Bible talks about when we go to heaven that we will receive new bodies. And so if you have a requirement or a request, you can submit those to God before you go. That you want to be taller, you want to have, you know, thinner, I want to have this, that. <laughs> We don't know what this looks like or means, but we do know that Paul tells us that our, our bodies will die because they are of this world. And when we're resurrected in heaven with Christ, that we will be given new bodies. Again, will we wear clothes? I don't know. Hopefully. <laughs> but we will be in heaven with new bodies. Second Corinthians 15 says this. Uh, he goes, what I'm saying, dear brothers and sisters, is that our physical bodies cannot inherit the kingdom of God. These dying bodies cannot inherit what will last forever. He goes, let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. We will not all die, but we will all be transformed. Verse 53 says, for our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. And so we'll be given new when God comes back and has a final judgment. And we'll be gathered up and, and, and heaven will be the destination that we'll go. We will be given new bodies at that point to exist in heaven with no broken bones, no sore muscles, no uh, disabilities, no nothing will be completely restored and renewed in heaven. And number four, the last one is this, so I'll end on this, is that in heaven, we will serve God. Revelation 22 verse three says, it's no longer will there be a curse upon anything for the throne of God and of the lamb will be there and his servants will worship him. Now I know in the church world, when we hear serve and worship, we automatically think Sunday morning, singing and serving in kids, right? That's, Amen. that's yeah. I mean, that is heavenly, of course. I mean, that is what God intended us to do. But uh, we think that we're going to be in heaven just singing all the time, you know? And I'm not a singer or a musician, and so I'm like, God, please let that not be completely all the time, because I don't mind singing once in a while, but like, I want to do something fun. I mean, I've told our, our kids heaven, and they kind of tend to think, well, it sounds really boring in heaven. It's like, well, sorry, I suck at communicating. I don't, it'll be good. It'll be like Chuck E. Cheese forever. Oh, yeah, you know. And we'll, we'll fix your theology later. But um, <laughs> heaven will be a place that we will serve God, that we'll be with God. I believe that we will have responsibilities in heaven, okay? Uh, responsibilities that we'll have. We could use work. Again, the word work is automatically kind of brings this kind of like, oh, I hate going to work on Monday morning, tomorrow I got to go to work. Work in the presence of God in heaven will not be burdensome. It will not be cursed. We know that in Genesis that labor was cursed by sin, but work in heaven. And, and I think most of us probably have periods of time when you are doing something meaningful, there's this satisfaction and fullness that rises in you. That is what work will be like in heaven. Uh, responsibilities, we don't know for sure, uh, but we can guess and assume that there'll be different things that we will do that'll be satisfying, it'll be fulfilling, and we'll be completing it for God and serving God. I love this, this idea that we sometimes think that 
heaven is a retirement home. And heaven is not a retirement home, okay? Uh, I'm sorry. For some of you who are close to retirement age, you're like, what? What is all this? Like, I don't believe heaven is a place that we just kick back and, and do nothing. Um, there's enough scripture that tells us that there'll be things that going on in heaven will be part of it. It's not just a place where you just clock out and you've made it and you're just going to sleep for eternity. No, it's not a retirement home. We have things to do. We'll, we'll sing, we'll make music, we'll be creative. All these elements to our life in heaven will be in eternity discovering new ways to worship, new ways to love, new ways to experience community and fellowship. Again, it's hard for us to grasp but we know that it'll be unimaginably wonderful beyond our expectation of what it will be. Psalm 1611 says this, you will show me the way of life, granting me the joy of your presence and the pleasures of living with you forever. So as we understand these kind of four basic truths, these elements to understanding what heaven will be like, we do know that it is a real place, okay? That God is creating the Garden of Eden is maybe a glimpse into how beautiful and magnificent it'll be. It'll be perfect. It'll be a place where we'll feel like home. It'll be a place that every tongue, every language, every tribe, every nation will be joined together in community, enjoying fellowship and worshiping God together. There'll be no more sin, no more sorrow, pain, death, but a life of complete happiness and joy serving God with our new bodies, our new identities in him, the fullness of who he is. And we'll spend eternity serving him and living in responsibilities. Again, what are those tasks? There probably won't be any pastors in heaven, so I'm out of a job in whatever years that is. Who knows what our tasks will be, but God created each and every one of us unique. And I do believe that we will have our uniqueness still. We'll have our creative abilities that God has built and designed us to do. But we know while we live on earth that these gifts and abilities are there to equip one another. We can imagine that that'll continue over into heaven. That we'll spend eternity encouraging and loving and sharing and creativity and and, and the presence of one another in God. But without fear, without sin, but complete fullness completely satisfied, no insecurities, no worry that we'll spend our life with him. What I want to do is have you stand this morning. I just want to close with this verse and this thought. Worship team can come up here. It's fun. It's amusing to think about all the things in heaven. Will we have a mansion? Will we have streets of gold, maybe. You know, that, I, that shouldn't be a determining factor whether you want to go there or not, if you get your own mansion or not. We don't know, uh, but we do know the certain things we talked about this morning. And it's easy for us to get caught up in the picture of what we're going to do and what we'll have and what it'll feel like. And, and all those things I think are fine. God created us to be uh, imaginative and, and have minds. What I find it's interesting is that most Scientists believe that we really only use about 5% of our brain. And you can imagine maybe in heaven, we bump up to 6% or 8% or 10% or 100%. You know, that there are so many things beyond what we can even tangibly understand. But the key in all this that I want us to understand this morning, the most beautiful, the most amazing part of heaven is not what it will look like. It'll not be what it feels like or what we're going to do. But the most amazing thing is this is that we will dwell with God. That we will be in his presence and experience in him. That we get to spend eternity with him. And I love this in verse three. This is God's dwelling place is now, now among the people. And God will dwell with us. And we will be his people. And God himself will be with them and be their God. There's something so powerful in that idea that that in all of its magnificence and all of its picture and all of its beauty, it won't even come close to the feeling and the ability to be with God. Now, I believe 100% that God is creating heaven for us to enjoy. 
But I would imagine, again, my assumption, when we get to heaven, to be in his presence will far outweigh anything else that he created that is good and amazing because we will get to be with him and he will call us his children and experience in him to the fullness.